So if you have your Bibles with you, if you want to flip to Acts, Acts is in the New Testament. We're going to be hanging out in chapter 8 of Acts. Uh, A few weeks ago, we started this series called DNA. And in this series, we're talking about the mission and vision of Family Church. And last week, Drew began to break apart our mission statement, which is people helping people find and follow Jesus. And so he started talking about people helping people. And uh, he also brought up something interesting, something we talk about a lot in the staff, but it was kind of the first couple times we've talked about in this kind of setting is, uh, let's get to it. So we have this upper room and lower room. A lot of people are drawn to the church because of the lower room. The lower room consists of place, personality, programs, and people. And what that really means is places like the location. Maybe it's close to our home or it's in the town or the city that we really like. Um, It could be because we've always been to church here and so we just really like it. Um, Personality, a lot of it has to do with who's ever on the stage, whether it's a worship leader, part of the worship band, uh, maybe it's somebody on staff or maybe even somebody that's teaching that we really connect with and so we like the personality. Um, For some people, it's the programs. Like we're really drawn to the church because they have a killer kids ministry, student ministry, men's and women's ministry. And so they have these amazing programs that just draw me in. And so I just love it. And then lastly is people. And people is the people who attend the church. And so we, we have a connection with certain people. Now, it's not that the lower room is bad at all, but the lower room has a tendency to get us stuck in only the church doing things. If I can just join the church and I can do that. But what we wanna do is help people realize there's an upper room and the upper room is our mission and our vision. And and so today we're gonna be talking about someone who understood this idea of upper room, that it's not about a place, personality programs and people. It is living a life on mission in the upper room. Now, most of us have thought that the only way to help someone find Jesus is to bring them to church. And so today we're going to be talking about find Jesus. We're in the second week of breaking apart the mission statement. And so we only think that the only way that somebody can find Jesus is bring them to church. Now, there's nothing wrong about bringing people to church, but, but what if I were to tell you that you can help people find Jesus by you being the person that helps them. Um, Here's the thing, back in the Old Testament, the only way that you can experience God is to go to the temple. That was it. And, and, but because Jesus came, he lived, he, he died, he, he rose from the grave and he ascended to heaven. He sent uh, his Holy Spirit and those who cross that line of faith they, uh, he sends the Holy Spirit inside of us. So we have God inside of us. No longer do we have to go to church to help people find Jesus, that they can find Jesus within us. So today we're gonna hang out in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter eight, kind of what's going on at this point is after Jesus had ascended to heaven, there's this breakout of a movement of God. This, the Holy Spirit is moving and empowering people, changing lives. And the religious people in that day were trying to squash it. And so they started to persecute the church. So much so that some people were being jailed, some people were beaten, and some people were just being killed for their faith. And, and so this, this movement of God is happening. And so people are scattering everywhere, not necessarily in fear, but they're scattering everywhere. And as they're going, they're still telling people about Jesus. In this region called Samaria, there's this apostle named uh, uh, Philip who's starting to do amazing things with God in Samaria. And God calls Philip to do something that's a little out of the box. And so in Acts chapter eight, starting in verse 26, this is what it says. It says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had came to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. Verse 30, 
So Philip ran and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Verse 32. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shear is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Two more verses. And he commanded the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Now, just pause here for a moment. This male eunuch literally had his manhood taken away. Not only would he have looked different, he would have sounded strange, uh, looked strange, and more than likely felt strange. Because he had no testosterone, more than likely, even if he was 30 or 40 years old, he would have still sounded like a 10-year-old boy. He would have had a disproportionate looking body and more likely been depressed. And here's the thing about this eunuch is that he would be a broken man, potentially a broken man. And because he's a eunuch, he is not allowed in the temple. And so I'm sure he's struggling with identity as a Jew, let alone as a male. But here's the thing. I'm going to put myself in Philip's shoe. As I'm on this desert road and I see this chariot, I would think to myself, what do I have to offer for him? Because apparently he has everything put together. And so God calls him to the chariot. And what do we see Philip doing? He runs to the chariot and he's standing there and he's listening to what this eunuch is saying. And so what I want to kind of take apart today is three ways that Philip did this right that we need to do in our life. Is number one is listen to the spirit. Listen to the spirit. Now, here it is in verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. For Philip to know the Lord's voice, there's a few things I noticed here, is that he would have to know what the voice sounded like. In my 18 or so years working with students, as well as with adults, I hear kind of a question quite often, or, or even a thought, how do I know what the Lord's voice sounds like? Or why can't I ever hear God's voice? To which I always point to the Bible and I say, once you know this, you have a pretty good understanding of what his voice sounds like. Meaning this, when you're at this crossroad in your life and you, you don't know if you're supposed to go this way or this way, if you know what this says, then you know where God is leading you. Um, do you have that kind of relationship with the Lord that you can distinguish his voice between your voice or the voices around you? Philip could. Secondly, is this, is that the submission to God's plan, that he has a submission to God's plan. Philip was doing amazing things in Samaria and God calls him to leave, not knowing where he's supposed to go. And he ends up on a desert road. For a lot of us, we don't know what God wants to do with our life. And so it's hard to submit something to him, submit our life to him without knowing where we're supposed to go. What would it look like if God calls you to go to your work, school, or that place you go on your lunchtime and, and talk about him, show him to people around you? Um, this story keeps bringing me back to this thought that, that God is all about perfect timing. In, in verse 20 says, 29, it says, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to meet him and heard him reading Isaiah. So this perfect timing. So he leaves Samaria, goes to this desert road, sees this chariot, approaches the chariot, actually runs to the chariot, hears him reading out of the book of Isaiah. 
and, 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 and doesn't exactly know what's being said. And so Philip is there. Philip didn't need all the details. He just responded. For too many of us, we wanna know like what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to do it, um, who's gonna come along with us. But Philip wasn't like that. Philip didn't need any details. He just responded to what God was doing. Now this happens when you live a life on mission. When you live a life on mission, you have godly appointments and godly opportunities. The question is, are you living on mission? Because sometimes when we're called to a mission life, we're needed to model. Now, for a lot of us, we, we're like, okay, that's what I'm supposed to, I'm just supposed to model. No, you're not supposed to just stick in modeling what a Christian life looks like. Sometimes you're supposed to speak up and say, you know what, this is what God is doing in my life. This is what God has for your life. And we're also called to disciple. We're called to model it, to speak it, and to be disciples. As a church, we want to be a disciple who makes disciples. But here's the thing, we're all called to be on mission. We're all called to be on mission. I love this. Your mission is where you live, where you work, and where you play. Here's the thing, you have influence that no one else does. A lot of us, we think, if I can only get my, my coworker to come listen to a preacher, if I can only get my classmate to come on, on our Sunday nights or even Sunday morning to sit with me and hear the preacher, or see the worship, then, then life, then their life would be different. The reality is I don't have the insight that you do with them. Drew, Jason, all of us, we don't have the insight that you have. You do. You have that connection with them that no one else has. Now, we've all had promptings before where we feel like the Spirit leading us in a direction and whether we do it or not. I, I wish that I could say every time I felt God leading me to do something, I did it. What would it look like if we did? Philip did it well. Secondly, is listen to people. Listen to people. In, in uh, verses 31 through 34, it says, and he said, because he asked him that question, do you understand? He said, the eunuch said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. It said, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, and what about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Philip connected by this man by just listening. All that he did was listen. Now, Isaiah is a hard book to understand. If you've been in church your whole life, been to a building church your whole life, or read the Bible, it is a hard book to understand. And he needed help understanding. I love this. By asking a question, it prompted an invitation. By asking that question, do you understand it prompted an invitation where this eunuch said, come up in the chariot and help me. Too many of us, we are unwelcome intruders instead of an invited guest. It's almost this idea of, I have words to say, you need to listen. I know what you're doing is wrong. Listen to what needs to happen. What if we flipped the script? What if all we did was listen? How different would your work, school, and your play area be if all you did was listen? Philip was ready to give an answer. Uh, next month, we're starting a new series, looking through the book of 1 Peter. And I couldn't help but notice that uh, something that Peter wrote really is applicable to what um, we're teaching today. Um, Philip, or excuse me, Peter was writing to a group of Christians in modern day Turkey that were experiencing such persecution and hardship. Listen to what he says. He says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, 
yet do it with gentleness and respect. Peter is saying, be ready to give the reason for your hope. I'm gonna tap on two things that may be a little uncomfortable. Number one is if we aren't in the word, how can we help people find Jesus? If we don't know what the word says, how can we guide people to Jesus when we don't really know him ourselves? Kind of a second thought here is too many of us are waiting for a mission. We're waiting for Pastor Craig to put on another Mexico trip or, hey, maybe I can go to Cambodia with them sometime and do a mission trip. Or, or maybe we think like, I, I can't wait for Charles to come and approach me about helping with like the youth group. Or, or I can't wait till Katrina comes and, and asks me about the kids ministry or Ryan to come and talk to me about family ministry. Like I'm ready whenever I'm approached to, but too many of us were sitting around waiting for a mission instead of living on mission. Remember, your mission is where you live, where you work, and where you play. Philip wasn't sure where God was leading him, but he knew God was up to something. So he trusted and he lived his life on mission. Number three is point them to Christ. Point them to Christ. It says in verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Philip started on common ground. He met him where the eunuch was at. Why do we often talk over people or maybe even want to impress them with how much we know about the Bible, about the scriptures, about what God says about us? What if we met people where they're at? What if we shared real life with them, share our struggles, our victories, the things that God is continually doing in our lives? How different would our world be? Remember, this Ethiopian was a broken man who was confused about a lot of different things. And then he hears about a God that came to him. You see, explaining who Jesus is and what he has done is the gospel. The eunuch is ready to follow and be baptized. Like he's, he's like, okay, I'm ready to do this thing. And so he, he ends up going to finding some water. And he's like, what prevents me? And so they go down, they get baptized. Then scripture says that Philip is taken away. I think if at that point I'm the eunuch, I'm like, what just happened, right? I mean, this thing is getting a little crazy, a little weird, but no, what, what the eunuch does is that he, it says, and he went on his way rejoicing. He saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. His faith was in God, not Philip. He, he didn't need Philip. He needed God and he trusted in that. And he presumably heads home. There's a Greek bishop, his name is Irenaeus, and he tells of what happened in Ethiopia, that there's this movement of God that began to happen in Ethiopia. Now, we don't know if this eunuch was kind of the tipping point for that or the, the beginning of that, but we do know that he was a part of something amazing that he had a community of people that's with him sharing the gospel and spreading the gospel. If we are people helping people find and find, if we are people helping people finding Jesus, we need to listen to the Spirit. We, we need to listen to people and point them to Jesus. Remember, your mission is where you live and work and play. And it doesn't just happen at church, it can happen anywhere in your life. Remember to always be on mission. Now, really quick, throughout this story, you can see the bless rhythm happening. And this bless rhythm we've been talking about for eight, 10 months or so for quite a while. And, and just to kind of break it on down, the bless rhythms is B, begin with prayer. L, listen. E is eating. S is serve. And the last S is share. And in this story, you see it happening. B, beginning with prayer. Obviously, he was listening to what God was saying, go to the desert road. L was, was listened, so he's listening to the eunuch. 
E is eating. Now, in this story, it doesn't talk about eating, but eating represents relationship. He met him where he was at. S is serve. He served him by helping him understand. And the last S is share, which he shared and pointed him to Jesus. Um, when I was 15 years old, I was invited to go to a church camp. And I, I didn't grow up church. And so it was kind of my first thing I ever did in a church experience. And so it's a big event with multiple states. And it was this, like 400, 500 kids would be there. And it's kids from Minnesota and Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, Iowa, and Missouri. And it was just a great event. It was a lot of fun. I remember just having the time of my life. I also remember on Tuesday night, I made that decision to pursue Christ. So I did what everyone else did. I was sitting in a pew and everybody else stood up. And so I stood up and then they asked us to come forward. So I went forward. Everyone else knelt, so I knelt. Everybody else closed their eyes, so I closed my eyes. And everybody else uh, followed a prayer that the leader was doing, so I did that as well. And I remember at that point, I, I felt different. I felt like I needed a savior, but I still kind of felt like myself. Um, so we get home on Friday night and the very next night, it's a Saturday night, I was invited to a party. And so I went to this party because I, I knew that I was a Christian. I knew that Jesus loved me and he forgave me so I can kind of do whatever I want now because I'm a Christian. And I didn't have the right understanding of who Jesus is and what that means like for my life. And so a couple days later, I went to a friend's house and my friend's house is actually my old basketball coach, his dad. We called him old man. Uh, he, at the time, he was like 42 years old and we called him old man. And his, and, uh, his wife, her name is uh, Colette, but we call her Mama Carter. And they invited me over and we just had a good time just hanging out. And that was kind of really the beginning of a family relationship. I credit them as my spiritual parents. And through questions and just them living it out, I saw what it looks like to be a life that's on mission with Jesus. They taught me about grace. They taught me about love. They taught me about a redeeming God who's always, always there for me. And here's the thing with old man and Mama Carter. Old man was my basketball coach. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a board member. He, he was just a guy that attended church but lived on mission. Mama Carter treated me as if I was one of her own sons. She loves so well. And here's the thing with old man and Mama Carter. It didn't begin with me and it hasn't ended with me. They are at this point still loving on people around them, living on mission. You see, they're just everyday people. They're, there's nothing like special about them except they are, they are totally 100% irreplaceable. Are you that in someone's life? Are you irreplaceable in someone's life, helping them point them to Jesus. Have a great week and we'll see you guys soon. Hey guys, thanks so much for hanging out with us for a few more minutes. I have a couple questions for you in the transformational moment. The first one is who do you need to listen to where you live, work and play? Who is someone that you need to kind of listen to what's going on in their life and the questions that they have? Secondly, is do you live your life on mission? And if not, are you willing? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for a chance to connect with you. God, I pray that you do your supernatural work and you help us help people find you. Give us the boldness, the encouragement that's needed to help people find you. Help us to realize it's not just on the church to do it, that, that the church is there to equip the saints to do the good work. And so help us to see that and believe that, that you live inside of us and you want us to help people find you. Help us to live on mission. We trust these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey guys, have a great week and hope to see you soon.